thank you all very much. Oh, this is so cool. I've never done this like that. Um, I am thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me. I've been speaking now for the last 30 days, pretty much every single day in a different city. We started off in Denver, Colorado, and we've made it all our way to Tampa, and this is my last event this summer. And so when I first, when I first came to America, I knew that I had a message that was on my heart. I didn't exactly always know how to express it. And now as I've spent more time in the United States, the message has really become clarified. And it's like it has come to its full fruition here tonight. And so I'm, I don't need notes. Um, I just believe that I'll be able to channel the message in the right way. But I've come here to, to give a gift from Israel. Because things in America are so confusing. No, it's really... There's so much static and there's so much information, there's so much stimulation and the COVID, the global pandemic, the lockdowns, the isolation, people have been spun around and they're just a little bit dazed and confused. And so the people of Israel, we have a spiritual technology that was passed down to us, spiritual gifts that were given to us. They were the gifts, technologies, techniques that were passed down from us, from the prophets of Israel throughout the generations. I mean, if you think about it, the Jewish people, we've been chewed up, spit out, trampled on, exiled, just every type of persecution that has um, humanity has ever seen has come upon the people of Israel. And somehow, we remained aligned and made it back to the land of Israel. How did we do that? Scattered around the world, with no common culture, no common language, no forms of communication, how would the Jewish people stay Jewish when the Catholics tried to convert us, the Muslims tried to submit us, the communists tried to erase us, the Nazis tried to annihilate us? How did we make it? How did, not only did we not survive, we made it back to the land of Israel and the land came back to life. How did we do that? So it's a gift that was given to us that we would never lose our identity that we would never lose our direction. And in fact, it is the final um, gift that will be given to the world. And it is the Jewish form of prayer. That's why the temple in Jerusalem isn't called a house of study for all nations. It's called a house of prayer for all nations. Because in study and in understanding, there can be multiple different understandings of a certain text. You can argue about it. You can understand it one way. You can understand it another way. The text can contradict each other, and sometimes both of the contradictions can even have truth to them. But in prayer, all of the arguments and all of the debates become radically irrelevant once everyone starts praying to God. And that's why the temple can bring all nations together from all different backgrounds and all different educations and all different cultures and all different languages, and everyone comes together. In fact, that song that we sung here tonight, that was Psalm 150. That was that's the last psalm in the book. It's King David's last prayer that was given to us in the book of Psalms. And his last line, the last prayer, his last hope, is that all souls will praise God. Kol haneshama to hallelujah, hallelujah, praise God. Hallelujah literally means hallelujah, praise, yeah, God. Hallelujah is the most international word in the world. Everyone knows that word. Groups from Korea, groups from Africa, groups from Hungary, where I needed a translator as I'm teaching them about Judea. But as soon as it came, we were all able to sing hallelujah together. What a vision King David had. He said, one day the whole world is going to come together. All souls are going to come together, and they'll actually be able to sing hallelujah together, which is so true. Who would have imagined? So it's in Jewish prayer. But here's the thing. I found something really remarkable, that the English word for prayer is really lacking. Prayer comes from the Latin word, which means to beg. It means that, yeah, which is not a wrong thing. Sometimes you want something. So you ask God to change his mind or to change the direction of your life or to help you achieve something that you haven't achieved yet, and you're asking, you're begging, you're praying for that to happen. But the Jewish prayer is a little bit different. We don't say that we're um, praying. There is one that's Va'it Hanan. That's one of the week's parshas that are coming up just in a little bit. Um, we say Lehit Palel. That's what we pray every morning, every night over and over again. Lehit labesh literally means to get ourselves dressed. So lehit palel means that we're doing something with God 
but it's something that we're doing to ourselves. It's less about changing God's mind and more about aligning ourselves with his will in our lives. It's about realigning ourselves. Now imagine this. Here are the Jewish people, 2,000 years, where every synagogue in the world is built with an architect to make sure that it's facing Jerusalem. Now, if you imagine how beautifully that looks from a bird's eye view, every synagogue in America faces the east. Every synagogue in Asia, all the way to China and to Australia, they all face the west. In Africa, the Jewish people face the north, and in Europe, we face the south. Now, imagine how amazing that is. For 2,000 years, every Jew from around the world praying to this center, pull, like pulling us back, pulling us back to the center. And what do we pray towards? We pray towards Zion, towards Zion. Now, Zion is a Hebrew word. It comes from the word Zion, but Zion actually means something. The word Zion has a, um, a meaning, an interpretation. What does the word Zion mean? It literally means like a mark on a target, like a bullseye. So imagine that. Not only are we praying towards Zion, we're actually saying, Zion is my target. That's my mark. That's my bullseye. That's where I'm directing my prayer. And in Hebrew, when someone prays with a lot of intention, he's focused, he's not letting his mind go in all different places, it's called to pray with kavanah. And kavana literally means, kaven means to aim. And the leader of Jewish prayer, he's, he's called a chazan, which comes from the word chazon, which means vision. But that's usually not what a worship leader does. Usually he's singing, he's speaking, he's preaching, he's, that's one with the, what does a man of vision have to do with leading us in worship? But that's the secret. It's saying that biblical faith in Hebraic prayer is actually more about aligning ourselves with a vision and a target. And what did the people of Israel do? We aligned ourselves with the vision of the prophets. We are going to be brought back to the land of Israel. That's our target. And you can spin us around, and you can put us in a blender, and we're going to wake up the next morning. And whatever happened the night before, it might have been a disaster, a pogrom, an inquisition, a holocaust. The Jew wakes up, dusts himself off, realigns himself with Zion and prays to come home. See, blessing in our lives, that's really what everyone wants, just for God to bless us, to be with us, to guide us. But the word blessing, it's like the, the, the biblical teachings that I've seen sometimes in the United States are a little bit more about, what's the word? Pros, to prosper. Prosperity. It's like, if you do this, but that, that's, I, I think there's truth to that, but I think a better word would be to flourish. Because prosper means you're going to be successful financially. Maybe you'll be blessed. I don't know if that's the case. You might be well in this. You might, it, might, it might be Bitcoin. It might be something disastrous. I don't know. But through that process, whatever journey you're going on, you will flourish if you walk in the light. You will become a greater human being. You'll become a better believer. You'll become a better person. You'll become more loving, more giving, more noble, more powerful. You will flourish. You might not necessarily um, financially prosper. That's really in the hands of God, and you can try to align yourself, but guaranteed is that you'll flourish. In fact, we're told that God created the world in love, and it's hard to really understand what that means in the books of Genesis. What does that mean? Because, you know, when we had a little baby, we have six. And you can see that the baby loves her Ima. You can see that she just loves her mom. But that baby can't even comprehend how much the mother loves the baby. The stress and the anxiety and the sleepless nights and the nursing and the feeding and the diapers. That baby has no idea what love is. I mean, it has a, something. I think that's a good analogy. Understanding like our love and then a transcendent love. It's transcendent. It's we don't have the faculties like the baby just can't possibly understand how much that mom loves her. But we see that in God's love, he created the world to flourish. Like we see grass and flowers and zebras and species. They just grew and flourish in this land. So too, he did it for us. And he gave us the guide how we're meant to flourish. Blessing in Hebrew is bracha. So it's not as much as achieving the blessing because the word brecha in Hebrew, which is the same exact word, is an opening like a pool. 
What we're saying is we want to create a space in us to align ourselves, to make a pool to receive God's blessing. It's not to achieve the blessing, it's to receive the blessing. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, of blessed memory, he was one of the greatest rabbis to ever live in the United States of America. He marched with Martin Luther King. Um, he was a prophet to the American people in his day, a, a genius, a, just a spiritual giant. And he has a beautiful saying. He says it like this, prayer may not save us, but prayer may make us worthy of being saved. And it's really about making us worthy, making us great, making us flourish. And how do we do that? Well, we have Zion. We have Israel. Isaiah says, Israel, atem edai, you are my witnesses. What does that mean? That means that, well, I'll give you a law. If you follow this way, you're going to flourish. You're going to become remarkable. Well, if it was one guy, well, pff, that guy maybe got lucky. Everyone wins the lottery every once in a while. So God said, watch this. I'm going to choose a nation, a nation on an international scale. And if they don't behave properly in the Holy Land, the Holy Land can't take that kind of behavior, and it will spit them out across the world for the whole world to see. And then one day, they're all going to be ingathered back into their land. And the land is going to respond. Here we are. I just to see this one prophecy that's so beautiful. It's in Leviticus chapter 26, and sometimes it's overlooked. But because we live at the edge of the desert, this promise is so phenomenal. This is Leviticus chapter 26, verse 31. I will lay your cities in ruin, and I will make your sanctuaries desolate. I will make the land desolate, and your foes who dwell upon it will be desolate. And you I will scatter among the nations. I will unsheathe the sword after you. Your land will be desolate and your city will be in ruin. So not only is God going to scatter us around the world for the whole world to see, he's going to unsheathe the sword after us. Never has there been a people that has been more persecuted than the Jewish people scattered around the nations. But here's the remarkable promise, and he says it twice right here. The land will be desolate, remain desolate, and your foes who then try to conquer the land, they're going to remain desolate on that land as well. That is the most remarkable promise because every empire since the destruction of the first temple tried to cultivate and control the land of Israel. It's the center of the world in the Middle East. All of the major roads go through Israel from Babylon to Assyria to Egypt to Lebanon. Israel is right at the heart of it all. So the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, all of these empires, the Turkish, the British, with all of their money and all of their power, tried to cultivate the land of Israel. And the land of Israel just locked herself up for the whole world to see that one day the Jewish people would return home and the land would unlock herself and reveal her beauty again. It's a witness for the world to see because it's not just one guy that made it back to the land. It's an entire nation that was all around the world for everyone to see. And as we return to the land, everyone can see. When we first arrived at the Arugot farm, it was rocks, thorns, barren, dry, unproductive, desolation. If you come to the Arugot farm at the edge of the Judean mountains where it meets the Judean desert now, you will actually see a Garden of Eden-like oasis in the middle of the desert. But you know, the first time I arrived at that farm, it wasn't a farm yet. It was just rocks. And I was sent there by the mayor of Gush Etzion. He said, this is the most strategic area in southern Judea that connects four Jewish communities. It's state-zoned land, and if someone doesn't cultivate it, it will be lost. So two pioneers went out to those mountains. They pitched a tent, and they started to try to work in that land. Farmers in the desert, what a rough job. Very soon they ran out of money, ran out of time, ran out of resources, they were losing hope, and the mayor said, Jeremy, go see if you can help these guys. I was like, help 
farmers in Judea. I was working broadcasting from Jerusalem. My wife is a lawyer in Jerusalem. I mean, we lived in, in Judea, but we were in a, quite an established settlement. I, don't, I mean, I just didn't know what to do with that. And all of a sudden, there's an organization that I love named Hayovel. They bring Christian volunteers to help farmers in Judea and Samaria. I said, well, that's going to be my mitzvah of the day. I'm going to introduce the head of that organization with those Israeli farmers, and hopefully they'll be able to help them. That's my good deed. Going to mark that off my list. Very good. Friday afternoon, I said, Tommy, you come here, and you can meet uh, Yossi. I'd never met Yossi before in my life. the first time I ever met him. I'm like, Yossi, Tommy, Tommy, Yossi, good luck. Go talk about your farmer things. I'm going to go walk off and see where I am. So they talked amongst themselves. It's logistically difficult because they're really based in Samaria. Not, Not much came of that, but it's okay. Slowly, maybe something one day. Then I walked to the edge of the mountains. Just, I'd never been there before. Now, the Arugot farm, it's, you know, it's the last mountains of Judea, and then it drops to the Dead Sea, the lowest place on planet Earth. From one of the highest mountains in Israel, it drops to the low, it's the views I, I can't, there's not enough words. I've tried to make music videos with drones to try to capture the magic. It just, until you see it with your own eyes. It's breathtaking. It's magical. It's like, it's intoxicating. It's spectacular. There's nothing like it anywhere in Israel. And I walked out and I looked at the view and I didn't exactly know where I was because I'd never been there before. I just saw what I saw. And it's hard to transmit or translate a spiritual experience in physical words because it's sort of not of this physical world. But if I had to, it was like my my soul left my body, was doing cartwheels of excitement in the air, and then went into the ground and never left. That's sort of what it felt like, if that makes any sense. And so Friday was over. I invited the entire Waller family over for Shabbat. At that time, there were 36 kids and grandkids. I never had such a Shabbat meal in my life. But that was my way of just thanking them for all of their work that they're constantly doing for Israel and helping the farmers in Judea and Samaria, and that was a wonderful Shabbat. Sunday came along, and I went right back to the mountain. And then Monday came, and I went right back to the mountain. And then Tuesday came. I just, I was like pulled to the mountain. It was, I had to go visit my soul. It was stuck there. So I just kept on going back to go and just be with myself. And it was like, I never felt such a calling to like, this is such a place. So I started like learning the Bible, looking at atlases, trying to understand what is this place? So it turns out that we're the northern border of the mountains of Zeph. And in the Bible, when David kills Goliath, the first king of Israel, Saul, just becomes literally insanely jealous, and tries to kill David. It says that David escapes to the mountains and wilderness of Ziph, and that's where he assembled his mighty men. And it was in those mountains and in those caves where King David built the armies of Israel. Those soldiers became his Delta Force elite commandos for the rest of his career. Those were his most trusted men. In some ways, the armies of Israel were built there, and so the kingdom of Israel starts there. David takes leadership in those mountains. And then I learned the mountains of Ziph, why did he run there? He could have run to Tel Aviv. He could have gone to Haifa. He could have gone to Samaria. Why did he go to the mountains of Ziph? Well, the Arugot farm is 15 minutes outside of Bethlehem. And so David used to take his flock and just go out into the mountains for weeks at a time. It's interesting because, you know, we live amongst the Arabs there, and you see that, you know, we have a small flock of sheep and a small flock of goat, and we take them out in the morning, and we kind of bring them back in the afternoon. That's a little bit Western. The way they do it in the Middle East, they take their sheep out, and they'll go out for sometimes a month at a time just to eat every little bit of green that they can find at those deserty mountains. Um, So David lived a little bit more like they do in the ancient times. He would take his sheep out for weeks at a time, And so in his time of trouble, where did he run to? To the place he knew best. That was his backyard. He knew where to hide. He knew where the water holes were. There's a famous story where David is in the spring of En Gedi, and he's in one of the caves there. And then Saul comes into one of the caves, and David cuts off a piece of his coat. And then Saul leaves, and David says, King, why are you hunting me? I'm loyal to the king. I could have just killed you. I have proof. Look. So En Gedi, that spring, that story is... The bottom of our valley, the Arugot Valley, the rainwater spills in to the En Gedi Spring. 
So David didn't hide in En Gedi because that was an obvious place to look for him. There's a, there's a water spring there. He had an ambush there waiting for him. But that day, he walked down into the valley, took an eight-hour hike, got to the spring, and he was caught that day. But in the Bible, like, that's where he lived. That's where he wrote so much of the book of Psalms. In the book of Psalms, it's not only that prayer is going to be the thing that brings all believers together. It already has. You could be a Catholic in Brazil, a Protestant in Germany, an evangelical Christian in Texas, or whatever you guys are here, <laughs> a Jew in Jerusalem, and when someone's sick and someone needs to pray, we open up the book of Psalms. And King David, it's like he taught the whole world how to pray. And those prayers came into the world in this mountain. I mean, until we paved the road, no one could even get to those mountains. You would need like hiking gear and climbing equipment. I mean, there was no access. It was like locked off to the world for 2,000 years. And so I just, I just loved that mountain. And at that time, you know, I'd wake up in the morning and pray in a synagogue, and I was like, gosh, synagogue, kind of boring. Why would I pray that I could pray in these mountains? <gasps> Why would I go to synagogue anymore? I'm going to the mountains. So stop going to synagogue. I start my morning routine. I wake up in the morning, run off to the mountains with my guitar, just prayed in the mountains. And then I go off to work in Jerusalem. And then just every day, uh, if I am in the land of Israel, a day has not gone by that I haven't been back at that mountain. I got to go visit my soul. It's still there. I'm just so connected to that place. So every morning I would go pray in the mountains, then go off to work in Jerusalem, go to the mountains, pray in Jerusalem. And I would come on like, Tehillah, you have got to see this place. Place. And he was like, Jeremy, I don't have time for your mountains. I have six kids. I'm a lawyer. I'm very busy. And she's like, okay, but I was just trying to, guys, you got to come and see. You got to come and see it. You got to come and see it. And then one day I'm sitting in the mountains. This is maybe two weeks in after my first encounter. And then I see Yossi. He goes around the mountain. He starts planting these olive trees all around the center of the mountain. And they're pretty big trees, like this big. I heard they were donated by an olive tree grower somewhere in central Israel. And so Yossi came the next day with a big land cruiser and a big tank of water, and he went tree by tree and watered them by hand. And then he came the next day and watered them. And, you know, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. But my grandfather, he walked from Russia to Israel in 1916. He was 15 years old, and it took him a year and a half to walk from Bialystok to the land of Israel. He went with a group of about another 20 kids between the ages of 15 and 20. And for the first two years of his life in the land of Israel, he joined the first kibbutz in Israel, right on the Sea of Galilee, called Kibbutz de Ganya. And for two years, he planted eucalyptus trees all around the Galilee. Because at that time, in the early 1900s, northern Israel was swamps, southern Israel was desert, and it was just empty and barren and desolate, just like the Torah promised. And my grandfather came and started planting eucalyptus trees. They brought them in from Australia to drain the swamps of the north. And I saw Yossi planting trees in the edge of the desert. And it just, it touched a place so deep in my heart. It's like, I never got to meet my grandfather. I only grew up on the stories of my grandfather and his generation. I was like, you can go to the barren parts of Israel and still be a pioneer in the year 2000? You can go and make the land flourish in our generation? That's like connecting me to my grandfather. It's really connecting me all the way back to Abraham. That was his original mission, to inherit the land of Israel, to build the kingdom. I was like, I just couldn't believe it. Yossi comes up to me the next day, and he's like, Jeremy, listen, I can't keep on coming out here and watering these olive trees. We've got to bring the water line out here. And I'm like, you planted trees in the desert without any water? That's crazy. And then he says to me, Rak be'emuna, only with faith. I'm going to plant the trees. God is going to bring the water. I'm like, okay. How much would it cost to bring the water line out to the mountain? He's like, well, the water tower is three kilometers away in the closest settlement called Maleamos, and then the piping and the infrastructure and the ditches and the digging and the pumps to get it up the mountain, it'd be about 110,000 shekels. So that's about $30,000 at that time. You know, Pastor Nick talked about divine appointments. So in Hebrew, there's no word for coincidence. That word doesn't exist in the Hebrew language because coincidence doesn't exist. So there's no word for it because it doesn't exist. But there is a word for occurrence. Occurrence is mikre, something that happened. 
But mikre is the letters rak mehashem, only from God. That every occurrence is rak mehashem, is only from God. In some ways, every occurrence, if you have the eyes to see it, may be open to being a divine appointment. And so, for about three or four years, every month, Teil and I put a little bit of money aside to buy a seven-seater for our family. Cars in Israel, you know, are taxed 100%. And so it took us a long time to raise that money. <laughs> and we had exactly 110,000 shekels in our savings account. Rock me Hashem. It's only from God. I went to Tehillah. I said, Tehillah, can we mortgage our tithes? And she's like, mortgage our tithes? What does that mean? I'm like, well, I just made it up right now. But like, what if we just give them all of our money now? And then we won't give tzedakah, charity, for a long time. We'll mortgage our tithes. And she's like, well, she came out to the mountain, finally. She's like, wow. It's like to bring the water line out to the deepest settlement in Judea, in our generation, to inherit the land and establish the mountains that King David wrote the book of Psalms. What better thing could we do with our tithes? So I went to the community bank because I have the coolest wife in the world. Said, I'd like 110,000 shekels cash, please. And the little community banker was like, what? And I'm like, yep, that's what I need. And she's like, okay. She calls the manager, like a security guard comes, and they start stacking 200 shekel bills on the table, and I start putting it in my backpack like I'm in the mob, you know? <laughs> and if I'd never had so much money out in my life, I never held so much money. I have like my gun on me making sure don't lose the bag. And I walk over to Yossi, finally in the mountain. I hand him my backpack, and I said, all right, let's bring the water line out here. And that was my introduction to this mountain. It was just like a love affair, irrational love affair with a land. And then I became so attached, you know, because there's a lie in the Western world that, oh, you'll love something if you get from it. But the Hebrew word ahava, the root of that word is hav, which literally means to give. The more you give to something, the more you love it not the opposite. It's not when you receive from someone that you begin to love that person, but if you invest in that child, you invest in your marriage, you invest in your beat up car that you, you'll start to love that car. What you give to is actually the root of love, not the opposite. What has she done for me lately? It's like the exact opposite. So the more we gave, the more we were in love. And we just you know, I did everything I could to try to help this place. And I was still living in this beautiful community. My brother was my next door neighbor. My children and his children were growing up together. We lived in Judea, so I had that box marked off. I was doing everything right. But I knew that if we wanted to really make this house of prayer for all nations, and we wanted to invite the world to come and celebrate Shabbat with us, and we wanted, we would have to live there. We would have to make it alive until then. It's just like an empty farm and construction zone. But to sell my home, that's really all I got. I mean, I've already given all I have. This is like my one asset, my savings. And this was in the middle of the Obama administration that was just hell-bent on giving that land away, ripping off the Jews from the land and establishing another Gaza Strip in the heart of biblical Israel, which, of course, is just a tactic to destroy Israel. Without Judea and Samaria, Israel is sometimes nine miles wide. I remember uh, President George W. Bush was up in a helicopter with Ariel Sharon, and Ariel Sharon showed him, said, listen, without Judea and Samaria, it's only nine miles wide. And he said, nine miles wide? In Texas, we got driveways longer than that. <laughs> nine miles wide. How can you defend a country nine miles wide? Exactly. That's the whole point. It's to weaken us until we can't defend ourselves. So I was like, oh, well, it's going to be slated to give away by the Obama. I mean, we'll be alone on the mountain. I mean, the IDF's not going to protect one crazy family on a mountain. They'll protect a village, but some crazy people on a mountain, we're going to have to defend ourselves out there. Oh, I got six kids on a mountain. That's scary. What if I fight with Tehillah? Who will be my friend? We'll be alone. No, what will, who will my children play with? They're going to come home from school. They will, I will be alone on a mountain? Like, sell my home? Like, that's just, I'm just... I'm not going to do that. That's crazy. But like in my heart of hearts, you know, because we spoke originally about like opening up a place for God's blessing in our life. We said, well, that's, it's like a Zion. We have a target. And if we like, st like imagine the ultimate good that could be in the world, in our own lives. Well, the prophets of Israel, they're the first 
human philosophers to envision world peace. They gave us the vision of the kingdom of God, that one day world peace will be here, a new consciousness where our priorities are realigned, where people can love instead of hate, that we can work together even if we're different. They're the first people. Until then, war was just the way it is in the world. War is just a part of the nature of the way it is. And the prophets of Israel say, no, the world is going toward a full redemption. And one day there's going to be a kingdom, a capital in Jerusalem, and it's going to bring a light, a new consciousness that's going to bring the whole world together. And so I just knew that the ultimate good in my life was to be on that mountain. My soul was calling me there but I just didn't have the courage to do it. It was too scary. It was so scary on so many different fronts. And so for years, I'm just struggling, struggling with this place. I'm wanting to move, but couldn't move. But I kept on giving. I kept on trying. Groups were coming. I tried whatever I could to help build it. But to make that sacrifice, to do that, just that was just beyond me. But it's to live in that struggle. That's the name Israel. Israel literally means to struggle with God. It's not to discover God. It's to say, well, I am where I am now. Where could I be? I am who I am now. Who could I be if I really brought my soul to the surface and I really manifested the best version of myself in the world and I really experienced and revealed what God destined me to be? Well, in that walk, that's a struggle. From where I am now to where I should be, that's just, that's, that's a walk that is literally to walk the walk of Israel. You know, we were, last Shabbat, we were in a little campsite in Tennessee for Shabbat. And my kids were finally relaxing. And I just love talking to people. And I saw this one guy, and he was a little bit elderly and a little bit overweight. And I just wanted to talk to him, like, hey, nice to meet you. He's like, oh, no, I live here. I'm like, wow, you live here. We, we vacationed here to spend Shabbat. It's amazing. You get to live here. Well, I said, what do you do? He's like, I've been working for 50 years, and now I do absolutely nothing. And I was, I was like, wow. That really touched my I was like, wow, he's in Shabbat all the time. I was like, wow. I was like so moved by that. Well, it's a lot easier to do absolutely nothing than to struggle with where we are now and where we could be to walk for a year and a half to make it to the land and start planting to try to build the kingdom of God. That's a lot more of a struggle than it is to do. But you know, that Shabbat, I was so touched by what that man said. So we're sitting outside on a picnic table and he says, Jeremy, can you go in the cabin and bring some ketchup? And I'm like, Tehillah, I've been married for 20 years and now I'm doing absolutely nothing on Shabbat. <laughs> So that's okay to do absolutely nothing once a week. But then six days of the week, it is to live in that tension, to become better, to become greater, to become more giving, to become more loving. That really is the walk of the Torah. That's the guidance of the Torah, just to bring our best selves out, to help us, give us the guidance. You know, because it's like, how do we live in that relationship? How do we live in that relationship? That's like, it's like beyond religion. Because a religion is sort of a structured reality trying to hold on to something. But just living in a communication, a guided life, trying to bring blessing into our lives, that's really beyond religion. That's just entering into a relationship with God and God speaking to us, blessing us, guiding us. Well, it was four years ago almost to the day. And it was the eve of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Truah, the Feast of Trumpets. And it was Saturday night. Rosh Hashanah was Sunday night. And so Teela and I decided we're going to go to an evening of preparation where if we're going to spend two days in synagogue, let's just try to make those two days meaningful. So Saturday night, we went to this evening of preparation, preparing us really for the whole year. So the rabbi is in front of the audience. He has a percussionist, a clarinet, a guitarist, beautiful Judean music. And the evening was a mixture between Torah and music and prayer and meditation, just Torah that can only be found in the land of Israel. They don't have that in Tampa, not yet at least. And here's what happened. He came up and he says, this is the time, Erev Rosh Hashanah, the eve before that let there be light moment. Rosh Hashanah is the new year because we celebrate the creation of the world. The world was created anew. He says the eve of Rosh Hashanah is the time on the biblical calendar right before God created it was when he was still dreaming what he wanted from creation 
before creation itself, whatever that means. And this is the most opportune time of the year to dream about what you want for your upcoming year because God is quite literally dreaming with you in these moments before the new year. And then he started to play music, and he said, all right, now is your time to dream. So I'm sitting on my chair and looking at everyone and sort of jealous because I don't know how to dream on command. And everyone's doing there so spiritual, and I'm like, oh, gosh, I don't know how to dream. That The music is playing for a while. And then finally, he starts to kind of give us some guidance. He's like, well, what's the picture in your mind? Where are you now? Who's with you? How do you feel? Put some color to it. And he starts kind of helping us put an image that comes to us. And I don't know where thoughts come from. Science doesn't know where thoughts come from. Science definitely doesn't know where dreams come from. It's just a mystery, beyond mysteries. Someplace so inside that connects us to the oneness of the creator. But all of a sudden, I start dreaming. And I have this picture. We have a house on the mountain on the farm. My kids are running through the grass, and groups are coming from all over the world, volunteering and working in the land and learning Torah and praying together. It's like, wow, just, what a great night, ready for the new year. Excellent. Thank you, Rabbi. That was a great dream. Anyway, we go home. We're lying in bed now, and I fall asleep immediately. Tehillah, it's a little bit of a longer process. And so I'm, just, my, I'm about to fall asleep, and Tila's like, so Jeremy, what did you dream? And I'm like, oh, what did I dream? Oh, Tila, I had the best dream. We had a home on the mountain, and our kids, and I told her the whole story. She jumps out of bed. She's like, oh, my, I can't believe it. And I was sure that I had done something wrong, because that's just usually what happens in my life. And she runs into the baby room. She opens up the door. I hear books come to bump, fumbling off the shelf. She pulls out a notebook, throws it on the bed, opens it up, and says, read this. And I open it up, and it's her journal from when she was a little girl. And the first line in the journal says, it's my 18th birthday, and I just had the most powerful dream. I only met Tahila when she was 19. I'm living with my husband and family alone on a mountain, and our children are running through the grass. <laughs> Groups are coming from all over the world to work the land and learn how beautiful the Torah is. And I'm like, what is this? And then the last two lines, I don't know how I'm going to get there. I'll need a partner to help me, but I believe this is what Hashem has for me in my life. what to do with that. What do you do? I sort of feel like I lost my free will at that point. I didn't really, I, what are we going to do with that? What are you going to do? What do you just, I mean, how many dreams did Joseph have? There's two. I mean, what, what's the, God put a dream in Tehillah's mind when she was 18 before I even met her. I mean, she's now a farmer on a mountain. She's like wearing high heels and going to court in Jerusalem. Like a totally, this was like the little journal of a little girl lost and put away for 20 years. Like who would have even thought? I never read her journal. Like what is this? I mean, what do you do with that? And so every reason out there was telling me, do not sell the home because politics, security, finances, responsibility, my parents, her parents, oh my goodness, you're going to break up the family, your brother's your next door neighbor, What's you're going to move to a mountain, the edge of Judea in the middle of the administration, what are you going to do? And I was like, but I, the regret of what my life would be, not following our dreams that were placed in such a special way for us, I just couldn't live with that regret. So my free will was taken away from me at that moment. I'm like, okay, I guess we're going all in. we're going all in on this. So, well, well, I, I feel like it wasn't that we said lahit palel is something that we do to ourselves more than we're trying to change God. We're trying to change ourselves in order to align ourselves with His will for us in our lives. That's really the heart of prayer. And so, you know, we say the Shema every morning and every evening. And it's, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your might. Now, we say that if we love God at that moment and we're inspired to pray, excellent. We'll pray it with the guitar in the mountains. But if we just don't want to pray to God now, I'm just not in the mood. I'm just, let me go to bed. 
You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. In every morning and every evening. Every morning and every evening. Every morning and every evening. See, the word emunah, which means faith, comes from two critical words. One is imun, which means practice. So that means that Hebrew faith is faith in practice, faith in action. That is that. Just some sort of belief or theology that I have about the way the world is supposed to look or the way I think it is is not biblical faith. Emunah is faith in practice. But there's another word. Ne'eman, which is the same root, is loyalty. When we feel inspired, it's easy. It's when we don't feel inspired to be loyal. That's emunah. So we pray in the morning and we pray in the evening. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your might. You should love the Lord your God with all your... And might is really not even a very good word. They had to translate it into something, and it's not a bad translation, but it's just not the right translation. The word is me'odecha, and the word me'od in Hebrew means very. So you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all of your very. So people didn't know what to do with that because that's not grammatically correct. All of your very, so it's like all of your might is all of your very. But such an important phrase. And you put a few Jews over 3,000 years, there are endless interpretations what that word means, me'od. So some people say it's with all of your possessions. That's what me'od means. All of your very, all of your possessions, all of your money, all of your family, all of your time, all of your might, all of your strength, all of your power. I just all, and it's like, wow, there's so many. And the answer is yes, all answers are correct. That's what it's telling us to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all of your very, all of your everything that you got. And I'm like, this is like, it's like we've been saying that and saying that and saying that. It's like, you know, you if you like lift a muscle, it's like a repetition. The muscle grows stronger. If you pray and you lead to Palel, it's strengthening a spiritual muscle. And it brought us, thank God, to the place where Teal and I said, when will we be ever to fulfill that verse that we can actually try to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our money, all of our possessions, all of our family, all of our marriage, all of our time, all of our life? We're going for the gold. My house sold within two months. And I was like, whoa, there's no turning back now. And the truth is, when that happened, I was so optimistic because God had done already amazing things on our farm. We were almost all ready to like move from nothing. We were actually able to move there. That's, I mean, the infrastructure, we're getting there. We're moving. And well, I've served in three wars in the IDF. I was just discharged from the IDF reserves this year at 41. So I served for 20 years, served in three wars. The eight months from around when I sold my house until moving to the farm and all of that was the hardest eight months of my life, no questions asked. So impossible. I mean, as soon as I sold my house and the bridges were burned, all hell broke loose in my life. It was a disaster. I then sold my home. Three quarters of my house was already built. The rest of my money I just threw into the farm because, all right, we're all in now and we're moving. We're going to build this mountain with everything we got. Then three European countries sued us in Israel's Supreme Court to destroy everything that we had built our center, our house of prayer, my home, all of the, everything, uproot just to destroy everything. And I'm like, there's four Jewish families that are moving to the edge of the desert to make a place of study and prayer and worship in the land. We've taken unproductive land and made it productive. What does this have to do with Denmark, Norway, and Germany? Three nations spent $1 million each funding lawyers to sue us in Israel's Supreme Court to destroy everything that we had built. Now, if you don't believe that there are spiritual forces that are at play, you're saying, what is, imagine that someone goes to America and they go to the edge of the desert and they want to build a place for healing and worship and prayer and study. Do you think three nations are going to attack four families building a modest home on a mountain? It's, what is that? But at that time, Homes have been destroyed in Judea and Samaria exactly in that tactic. It's like we are where the rubber meets the road. We are trying to inherit Judea, and there are forces that don't want that. 
But at that time, I was like, oh, all of my money, well, I'm going to be homeless. I'm going to be penniless. I have six kids. Where are we going to live? What are we going to do? Oh, no, what have I done? How are we going to get through this? How are we going to be able to fight nations that have unlimited money to, hey, we don't have anything. How are we going to stand up to this? At the same time, a Jewish woman from Switzerland came earlier to the farm, and she said, you're going to build a house of prayer for all nations from all countries to come and learn about the Psalms of King David and learn Torah in the mountains? That's the most beautiful thing that I've ever heard of or seen in my life. How much money do you need to finish off the whole center? And at that time, Ari said, $600,000. Because at that time, that were as many dollars as there were in the world. <laughs> That's what we thought. We'd never built a mountain before. We didn't know. That's just what he said. And she's like, I've just never been touched like this in my entire life. I'll do it. Two weeks later, she wired us $200,000. A woman, we had never met a Jewish woman from Switzerland. And then we signed a contract with the contractor. Our center started being built. Things were moving forward. She sent us another $200,000. This farm is being built from nothing. What a miracle. It was that that gave us the courage. Like, God is with us. Look what he's doing. Sold my home. We're on our way. Then I get an email from the woman in Switzerland. Oh, I'm so sorry to inform you. The Swiss government has decided to tax all of the money that I've given to Israel 100%. So the $400,000 I've given is now an $800,000 expense, and that's barely the money that I have to pay the government now the tax. I'm like, they're taxing you. You should be getting a tax deduction for building a ministry in the land of Israel. What an outrage. These European countries are coming against us in such an insane way. What is going on? This poor woman, she, they're taking her money for nothing. That is an outrage. And I'm like, oh, I signed a contract with a contractor. I hope he's not mad. Well, a week later came, and the contractor said, well, I'd like my next payment. And I was like, um, well, there was an anti-Semitic tax issue in the Swiss government, and there was a Judea and Samaria, and we're trying to figure this out with lawyers. We're, and he's like, I, I don't, I'm, a tr I'm a builder. I don't know what you're saying. I have materials that I've purchased. I have employees that I need to pay. I want my money. And I'm like, you are absolutely right. I'm going to work on that really hard. He's like, if I don't get my money in one week, I'm out of this whole project. And I'm like, no, 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 no. My home I can still pay you for my home because I sold my home. I have money for that. That's my staff house. I'm building that. Let the center, we're going to work there. We're going to figure that out. But don't leave me without a home because I sold my home. I won't have a home if you don't build my home. Well, one week later, there was still no money, and the contractor left. And now I'm like, oh, gosh. I don't know where I'm going to go now. I don't know. We're so good at traveling now because of that time. We didn't know. But now we travel kind of light. Then it was with everything that I had. And so we spent one week in Jerusalem and one week in Tiberias and one week with her parents and one week with my parents and just for two months, just trying to find a way to get to our mountain, fighting off the Supreme Court. And now we don't go into debt. That's just not the way we live. If God would want it, he would give it to us. We don't need to take something that doesn't yet, it's not ours. So we save our money to buy a car. I found myself in 700,000 shekels of debt. And I've never been in so much debt in my life. And I'm like, oh gosh, what? I have no home. I have debt. The European Union is attacking us. What has happened to my life? What has happened to my children? What am I going to do? It was just impossible. The stress was so overwhelming. I mean, I became gray. I became great. And I thought now that life has sort of calmed down, okay, it'll turn brown again. No, this is permanent damage. <laughs> permanent damage. It was just so stressful. And I didn't know, I mean, but the obstacles were so insurmountable. Like, how are we going to get out of this? What are we going to do? And then finally, we figured out how to move to our home, but our home wasn't exact. We didn't have a kitchen. And do you know what a compost toilet is? A compost toilet, for those of you that don't know, is a closet outside of your house, and it's just a bucket that you poop in. 
And so imagine six kids trying to get six kids ready for school with a compost toilet. It's like, Emuna, on the compost toilet. The bus is coming quickly. Okay, okay, I'm, no, I'm on the comp. Come on, let's go, let's go. And I'm going to bed. I have no kitchen. I'm like, what have I done to myself? I had such a good life. I was in such a happy place. What have I done to myself? I mean, I would, I've become stronger I thought that I was courageous. I just was at bed. I was just crying myself to sleep. What have I done to myself? I did this to myself. What have I done following my dreams? What am I crazy? That's not responsible behavior. I have six kids. What am I going to do? And you should know I wish you could meet Tehillah. She's just the most amazing person in the world the entire time. Never didn't complain. She never complained. She's like, this is the adventure of a lifetime. Oh my gosh, we're, we're following God's dreams in our life. We're never going to regret this. Compost toilets, they're so ecological. I love compost. We should always have compost. I'm like, Taylor, we need a toilet. We need normal toilets. We're not having a compost toilet. No. Just, just the most amazing woman ever. And then at this time, you know, I was just talking to Pastor Nick about this, that, you know, the Torah portion is another technology that was given to us, like a gift for the exile. That it would be hard to have reception in the exile. It would be hard to tune into God's word for us. And then God said, here you go. Every week, every Jew around the world for 2,000 years has the same broadcast, the same message from Tokyo to Taiwan to Brooklyn to Jerusalem. And now all of a sudden, the movement is growing in believers all over the world now that are not necessarily from a Jewish background are all now reading the same broadcast, the same message. And as we're reading this message, I stumble upon the parasha of Lech Lecha, the story of Abraham. And, you know, the, the story of Abraham begins in Genesis chapter 12. And it starts off with two words, Lech Lecha. And every English translation that I've ever seen doesn't translate it right. The words in Hebrew are lech, lecha, go to yourself, to yourself, to yourself. Le is to. Go to yourself to the land that I will show you. Okay, well, so they have to change that because that doesn't make any sense when you go to yourself to the land that I will show you. Well, what it's telling us from the get-go is Abraham has an outward journey, and all of us have an outward journey. Everyone has our own Zion in our life. If we imagine, what is the ultimate good that I could manifest in my life? That's where I'm going. I'm going to, I'm going to build a family. I'm going to get married. I'm going to have children. I want to raise them like this. I have this job. I want to give this amount of money to tzedakah. I have this vision of who I could be and how many people that I could bless. That's an outward journey that everyone has. But that outward journey from the get-go is lech lecha. It's really an inside journey. It's a journey to yourself to develop an itch, a rich inner world. That is the outward journey of life as a believer. And as I start reading about this, well, the fundamental claim of this story is that you can hear God's voice in your life, that you can actually live a guided life, that God is giving Abraham guidance, go to this land, and he acts based on guidance given to him. Well, if I was going to teach people, listen to God's voice in your life, and you'll be blessed. What happens to Abraham in the story of the next few verses is that the financial situation for him and his family becomes so dire, he doesn't go into debt, he almost dies of starvation. He has no livestock left, he has no food, he has no money, and he has to escape to Egypt to live. He's about to die from the hunger in the land. There's literally no food to eat. And then he doesn't encounter governmental tyranny from Norway, Denmark, and Germany. But he reaches another governmental tyranny, and Pharaoh takes him, puts him into prison, and kidnaps his wife. It's like, well, what kind of sales pitch is this? Listen to God's voice in your life, and you'll end up starving with your wife kidnapped. It's like, well, what is that story? That's not a good sales pitch. You would like to hear, like, oh, do this, and you'll be blessed, and do this, and you'll prosper. That's not what it's saying here. It's not telling us anything that, it's just telling us how life is. Telling us the truth. That if you take that journey from where you are now and you want to build the kingdom of God in Jerusalem or the kingdom of God in your own life, it's not going to be easy. He goes into 
war. I mean, the first few nights that we moved to the farm, we were alone on that mountain. And it's so alone. There's, it's so dark. It's so, it was so dark. There was nothing there. So we flip off the lights. All we have is stars above us. But we're in the most contested real estate in the world. Maybe after the second, the Temple Mount is the most contested. The deepest settlement in Judea, where we were, that, that was the most contested. Real, look what happened. Three European nations came. Switzerland's taxing us. I mean, it was like a fight for that land. So at nighttime, Ari and I would patrol around my house. Both of us in active duty, not in reserve duty at that time, soldiers. I would take from 12 to 3. He would take from 3 to 6. And every night, we're going around our five, six children because we were alone. So I'm exhausted fighting off whatever enemies that were there to be seen or not to be seen. We didn't know. In financial stress, fighting off governmental tyranny. But as I'm reading the story of Abraham, never have I been given such a medicine. That that's guidance for us. That if you follow God's voice and you walk in that light from where you are now and where you could be, that is to walk in that light. That's why the Torah, it's, in English you call it law. In Hebrew it's called halacha. But halach literally means walk. That is the walk. This is the walk. Where we are and where God intends us to be if we live our soul. So then we walk in that light. That is the halacha. This is just the guidance of how to walk in that light. You know, in Israel, I wake up really early. The jet lag in this trip is totally thrown off my schedule. But in Israel, I try to wake up before the sunrise. And every single morning, I have two voices that come into my head. The first voice says, Jeremy, go back to bed. Every morning. And then I have another voice in my head that says, oh, Jeremy, get up. This is the best part of the day. Get up now and you'll be able to plan your day. You'll be able to pray. You'll be able to learn. You'll be able to, you'll be a better father. You'll be a better husband. Get up now. Come on. Your whole day will be different if you just get up now. Who is the real me there? There are two voices that are speaking on my behalf and that's like very confusing. And the English language has totally confused it because the Torah teaches us that we're made of material and then God breathed life into us. But breathe is really, that's not a great word. Nishima in Hebrew is breathe. Nishama in Hebrew is soul. So the Bible says you are physical material and then God breathed the soul of life into us. This awakeness that we have in this physical body, that's our soul. And there are two voices, one that's calling us to our physical, calling us to sleep, to comfort, to relax, to the physical. And then one is calling us to walk in the light. One is calling us to love, to truth, to enlightenment, to giving, to gratitude. One is calling us, and it's like, well, there's two voices. And the Torah is saying, just bring out the soul. To man, In English, you know, you say, I have a soul. But that's not true. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. But you say, I am hungry. No, you're not hungry. Your body is hungry. But look how the language is totally confused. What are you? Who are you? So the Bible is just very clear, just so you know. If you want to live a guided life and you want to hear the voice, there's two voices. Choose wisely. There's the voice inside. And, you know, when we talk about the wisest of all men, right, that's King Solomon. And this is one of the most important teachings. So this is the first book of Kings. David dies, and Solomon takes his place. And then God appears to Solomon in a prophetic dream and says, Solomon, just because you're King David's son, I'm going to give you one wish. Anything that you want, you'll get. You can ask for anything. Do you know what Solomon prays for? So a lot of people think that he prayed for wisdom because he was known as the wisest of all men. But if you open up the Tanakh and you open up to 1 Kings chapter 3, he doesn't ask for wisdom. Look what he asks for. And now, Hashem, my God, you have crowned your servant in place of David, my father. But I am a young lad. I do not know how to go out and come in. Your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a large nation that can neither be counted nor numbered because of its abundance. May you grant your servant a listening heart to judge your people, to distinguish between good and evil. Listening heart, it's not wisdom. Wisdom is knowledge, information, an IQ, it's up here. A listening heart is down here. 
And what does he say? He's like, I'm a king. I have so many decisions that I need to make now. Do I build this? Do I not build this? Do I go out to war? Do I not tax the people? I just have endless amounts of decisions. How do I make decisions in my life? Well, all of us are the kings of our own families or the kings of our own lives. Do I marry this person? Do I marry that person? Do I take this job? Do I go off here? Where do I vacation? What do I do? So many decisions. Solomon says, I have one request. Just give me a listening heart. A listening heart that when I need to make a decision, I want to be able to hear you in my heart to distinguish between right and wrong. That I can hear the right voice, that I can hear your voice in me that I want to live a guided life. And then he became the wisest of all men because every time he made a choice, he asked God, please, what should I do? And with a listening heart, he transformed his kingdom. He built the temple. That time for about 40 years is the closest thing we have in all of biblical history to the messianic era as it should have been. There was a temple. The nations were coming to seek Solomon's wisdom. There was peace all around. It was like a window in to what it could be. And then I said, what is our dreams with the Aru Goat Farm? What would it look like if Mashiach was already here? What would it look like if the world was already redeemed, if it was fixed, if everything was the way it was supposed to be? Let's make a window of that in the mountains of Judea right now. What would it look like to have a place where the nations can come and they can learn Torah in the land? What would it be like if the Jewish people make the desert blossom like a lily? What would it, let's build it right now. Let's try to manifest it now and pioneer that way in the world. See, to have a listening heart, that's not, that's not a religion. That's transcending. See, the house of prayer, it's not, it's like something else. There is no temple in the world today. It's going to take us to a new level. It's like the conflict in the Middle East. There's no solution to the conflicts and problems of the world. They're not going to be solved. They're going to be transcended. And so our generation is here to transcend. And the spirit of this is not of a doctrine. It's not of a particular way. It's beyond that. A house of prayer for all nations is something that's beyond. And so to live a guided life, to make a pool to receive God's blessing, to like make that space. So Hashem communicates to us in so many different ways. And one of the coins that we've, the frame, the phrases that we've coined on the fellowship is a spice cart. And that's one of the most important terms that I've ever taught. And so there's a story in the book of Genesis that you all know. Joseph is sold into slavery, betrayed by his brothers. Dark time in our history. And then it says in the book that he's sent down to Egypt on a spice cart. It's like, Why is that relevant information? If he was carried down to Egypt on a camel or on a donkey, why does we care that he's on a spice cart and not something else? Like, why is that a horse and a buggy? Like, why do we need to know that? And the sages of Israel give us such a deep understanding here. If you notice from that point on, Joseph never complains ever. He's sold into slavery, betrayed by his brothers. He's then sold to a master. His master then blames him for a crime that he didn't commit. He's then sent into prison everywhere he goes. He's the most loved guy. He's optimistic. He's hopeful. He's charming. He finds grace in everyone's eyes. He's not like, oh, this is just a miserable thing. He never has that ever in all of the stories because of the spice cart. In his darkest time, The sages of Israel teach us that that route from where he was down the Dead Sea to Egypt, that trail was the trail that uh, merchants of sulfur traveled that trail. And sulfur smells really bad. All of a sudden, Joseph is on a spice cart. And he's like, well, that's just really out of the ordinary. And God said to him, just know in a time that you look like you're all alone, your brothers have betrayed you. You've been sold down to Egypt into slavery. Here's a spice cart. I'm with you. Don't worry, this is all a part of my plan. Spice carts are sent to us in our lives all of the time. Things that are just a little bit out of the ordinary, things that didn't need to be there but are there. It's communicating to us. Sometimes it'll be in dreams. Those are pretty rare as far as the Bible's concerned. Maybe that's once in a lifetime, maybe twice. Sometimes it's in an inner voice that we can hear. But sometimes it's in people that we meet. Sometimes it's in things that happen. I just told a story to Pastor Nick that... The motel that I stayed at in Denver. Like, what were the chances? I, the first place we got to in Colorado. We had a 30-hour trip. I mean, it was like from Tel Aviv to LA. 
a four hour layover in LA, and then from LA to Denver. And then by the time we got to Denver, my kids were like dizzy and they're just disoriented. And then we had to get to a T-Mobile store to get a SIM card so I could start using Waze. How we even found a T-Mobile store is relatively miraculous. I'm like, I don't know, we'll just drive until we see one and we're like so tired. We get to this T-Mobile store and I'm starting to talk to the agent behind the table. I'm like, oh here, can we just have a SIM card, just a month's package, whatever we need. And then Tahila, she nudges me and she's like, Jeremy, there's a man outside in the, in the parking lot that he's struggling to get his wheelchair in the car, go help him. And we were just in LA and people in LA are crazy. It was the, I mean, they were the masks over the nose. If my kids the no, came down, they would yell at my kids. No one was talking to each other like a twilight zone. Don't go to LA. Stay in Florida. So I told Tahila, I'm like, oh, Tahila, I mean, the guy's outside. I just, maybe it's Corona. Maybe he doesn't want strangers approaching him. And she's like, Jeremy, that man is a wheelchair. Go help him, please. And so Abraham is commanded to listen to Sarah in the Bible. Oh, <laughs> We take that verse very seriously in, in our family. We take that verse quite seriously. So I'm like, she's usually my higher voice anyway. So I'm like, okay, listen to Tahila. So I go outside and I fold the man's chair, get him in the thing, help him into the car. And he's like, where are you from? And I said, oh, I'm from the land of Israel. I just arrived. The man tears up and starts to cry. And he's like, my life's dream has been to make it to the land of Israel. I was told that Jerusalem has a lot of stairs. And I said, but there's so many places in the land that don't have stairs. Start preparing now, because soon they're going to open the gates and you should come. And I said, the God of Israel must love you because of all T-Mobile stores that I stumbled upon in Colorado. Somehow I came here and my wife is so righteous, she asked me to go and help you. But there's spice carts all the time in our lives. People that we meet that we shouldn't meet that are just there, that are just... So it's living in a dynamic reality was the witnesses of Israel. That's how we started this talk. What is that saying? It's saying that there is a living God that is interacting with the world, bringing family after family all back to a particular land. And if he's bringing every single one of these families from every single country, it's a testimony that he's alive and guiding all of us if we're open to that guidance. Because you don't have to listen to any voice. You could just go back to bed in the morning. You don't have to have a listening heart. You don't have to listen to the Ten Commandments that say, hey, the seventh day is really special. It's blessed. You can totally ignore it and never know the blessings of Shabbat. It's up to us, free. He's given us this amazing gift to choose the walk that we walk in life. There's just so many ways. Total freedom, the greatest gift he's given us is that we can choose any way we want to be. And the Torah is telling us, if you want to flourish, walk in the light. But as I went through all of these times in the farm, I was like, oh, it's so hard. <laughs> God, why do you have to make it so hard? And then as I was reading the stories of Avraham, Avraham becomes a blessing to the entire world. He becomes who he was because of what he went through. The tests that he passed, the courage that he displayed, in challenging times, that's actually where we flourish. The world was created for us to flourish. In great times, it's hard to feel gratitude. It's like easier to forget God. In hard times, that's when you hold on to every blessing. I remember in Israel, they took the lockdown so seriously. I mean, it was like serious. We built a mountain to be a place for the world open to guests. And all of a sudden we found ourselves alone on this mountaintop in the middle of nowhere. And then in order to send our kids back to school, we would have to write, this morning our child has not coughed, has not shown any signs, has no fever, and make a, a, a parent sign thing that we could send them to school. And then every morning I saw them like, that is the most beautiful thing. So every morning I would write a little prayer, thank you God for my child, Lavi, that he is happy and healthy and well. Thank you, God. And I would give that to the teacher every morning. It's like in the hard times, all of a sudden, we can experience gratitude. If things are easy, well, there's no courage. And if you're not scared, that's just stupid. It's in hard times when there's fear that you overcome and express courage. 
It's hard to tell the truth. It's much easier to lie. It's like the hard times bring out the best in us. And the Torah is teaching us, if you walk in the light, you will flourish and you'll grow in to be the person you are destined to be. And then all of a sudden, we miracles occurred. All of our problems that seemed insurmountable, one by one, we won our case in the Supreme Court. How we beat three nations, four Jewish families, that's not possible. All of the, everything was just one by one removed before us. And all of a sudden, people from all over the world started coming to the Arugot Farm and Center. It was still under construction, but people wanted to see it under construction. And then people would come in our house of prayer. It's this circle dome building. The first dome ever to be built in the world was built by a Jewish architect named King Herod who built the second temple. And I said, let's do that in honor of the king that restored the te second temple in its glory. And we built this beautiful dome. But the way it was built, groups, and when I say all over the world, I mean Korea and Taiwan and Hungary and Holland and Germany and Africa, all over the United States, Canada. I mean, the whole world. And then groups would come and someone would leave 50 euros, someone would leave $100, someone would leave 20 shekels, and then we'd have a little bit more money, buy a little bit more cement, add another row, another row, another row of stone, and then slowly but surely this house of prayer started taking shape. And it was like a house of prayer for all nations, quite literally built by all of these nations that were coming. It was like, oh my, our dreams are literally manifesting before our eyes. We couldn't believe. I, was, I wake up in the morning, I'm like, I, I just was in a constant state of wonder, amazement, just radical amazement at the wonders of God. And as we were moving forward and things were really revving up, there was a global pandemic that shut everything down. I was like, oh, oh God, what are we going to do now? What? I mean, a global pandemic. What is I don't remember that being a part of the plan in the Bible. What is this? What we, is this the end of days? We don't even have a cow. I barely have a toilet. What do we even have a cow? I'm not ready for the, uh, what are we going to do? We're not ready for this yet. I wish to do it. So it's two weeks of panic. It's chickens. What are we, what are we, how, what's going to happen here? And then after two weeks, I was like, okay, well, what's the next? We got to pivot. What are we going to do now? Our center that was like the engine was being run by tourism in Israel got hit so hard. All the hotels empty, all the taxi drivers out of a job, all the tour guides. I mean, so much of Israel's industry is welcoming guests and allowing them to experience God's presence in the land. That's like what Israel does best. And all of a sudden, people can't go anymore. And let me tell you, the people I've met so many people. When the gates open, there's going to be a flood of people that took Israel for granted. Oh, I'll make Aliyah next year. Oh, I'll, I come to Israel all the time. And oh, yes, I'm going to make it there. I'm going to have it planned. I'm going to be in a few years from now. All of a sudden, it's like, what? We can't go anymore? When they open the gates, there is going to be something historic that happens. There will never be as many tourists that are going to flood the country like what's about to happen. It's going to be something unbelievable. But right now, Israel is just, what were we going to do? It was totally locked down. And we're like, okay, well, you know, when you're all frazzled and it's difficult to have any reception. And so I try to turn to the Tanakh to find some sort of wisdom. So I open up to the book of Zechariah, and I've read the book of Zechariah a bunch of times, but it's one of the most sort of end-of-days prophets that we have in the Hebrew Bible. And as I'm reading it, I come upon two prophecies that are really interconnected. Both of them are end-of-days prophecies, and both of them gui guided my next steps. Because being the deepest settlement in Judea, we became spokesmen. I mean, Fox News came out to do a story on our farm, reporters, politicians, the Trump administration sent us a flag that was flown over the Capitol. It was a bill that they passed that was run by the congressman in Charlotte, North Carolina, because in their registries, we were the newest and deepest settlement in Judea. And that was the administration's way of saying, this is a new era. We are now supporting Jewish settlement in Judea. And they flew a flag over the Capitol. They put it in this beautiful glass wooden triangle, shipped it overseas. And it's right now at the right entry of my home, this beautiful flag. It was like, we became these spokesmen for the Jewish rights to Judea. Because right now, I don't know if you heard, but there's this squad in your government that's doing everything it can 
to undermine Jewish rights in Judea. They don't call it Judea. They call where I live the West Bank. And that's really an illogical name because what is it west of? If you look on a map, it's west of Jordan, but Jordan has no claim to the land. They're not asking for the land, so why is it called the West Bank? It's just an illogical name. Well, it's a lot easier to say, well, occupying settlers evacuate the West Bank for political. It almost sounds legitimate to evacuate the settlers from the West Bank. That sounds almost okay. But really, what they're saying is, Jews, get out of Judea. And that's a little bit harder for the ear to swallow. It's like, oh, I don't know what to do with that. Because why are Jews called Jews? I mean, in the Torah, we're not called Jews. We're called, Abraham was a Hebrew. Then we're called the children of Jacob children of Israel, Israelites. Where is this word Jew? The last book in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, is the scroll of Esther. That's the first time we see that word. Mordechai is called Mordechai the Jew, from the tribe of Benjamin. Well, if he's from the tribe of, the verse says Mordechai the Jew, from the tribe of Benjamin. Well, if he's from the tribe of Benjamin, why is he called a Jew? It's not because of the tribe of Judah. Jews are from Judea. The place, like Japanese are from Japan, Chinese are from China, Germans are from Germany, Americans are from America, Texans are from Texas. Jews are from Judea. It's not that the land belongs to us, we belong to the land. The land birthed our identity as we describe ourselves in the world today as Jews. Jews are from Judea. Imagine the outrage, the lie saying an occupying force, evacuate the West Bank. It's like trying to disconnect the Jewish connection to Judea, erasing the Bible, erasing all of history, erasing every map, because the mountains are the mountains of Judea on every map, the Judean desert. We are from Judea, calling it the West Bank. It's such a lie. But that's why Jerusalem is called the city of truth. But it's not easy to say the truth, because now <laughs> we have to go up against forces much larger than us. Well, here's what it says in the book of Zechariah. It has two parts. Verse 23, this is chapter 8, verse 23 and on. Thus said Hashem, master of legions, in those days it will happen that ten men of all the different languages of the nations will take hold of the corner of the garment of a Judean man, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Wow. Okay. Ari and I are like the last Jews in Judea. <laughs> right? And so this place that we're building is like the physical reality of a spiritual idea. Let's try to do the spiritual idea. So we started the Land of Israel Fellowship. At that time, it was just a, it was an act of desperation. We didn't know what else to do. We said, okay, well, we're trying this mission. Let's take our mission to the virtual and see what happens. All of a sudden, more than 100 people joined. Then another 100 families. Then another 100 families. Then another 100 families from 45 countries, from the nations all around the world, started joining this fellowship rooted in the mountains of Judea. It was like, whoa, what is going on? Imagine what's happening here, but then it's happening in Colorado, and it's happening in Katwijk, Holland, and in Cape Town, South Africa, and in Germany, and Ulm, and in England. It's all over the world. Ten, like, grew small pockets of people started growing, attaching themselves to Judea. And I'm like, whoa, what is this? And in the fellowship, so... I mean, there's 30% uh, of them are Jews. It started off with a majority of Jews, but then there are just so many more of the nations. There's only like 6 million Jews in Israel. There's so many. And that's 30% Jews, two Catholic nuns. And on Zoom, you see her with a penguin thing and everything. I'm doll. You see a Catholic nun that's attending this thing. Three Buddhists, two Muslims, Jews of all different tribes, rabbis and pastors, all at the same thing. And at the beginning of every fellowship, we start with a prayer. It's okay, let's manifest it. We can, house of prayer for all nations. But here it comes in every session. It's like, and it's all around. There's someone that wakes up at three o'clock in the morning from New Zealand. I kid you not all over the world at the same time from all of, and we're all praying together through the Judea, in, just like, 
what is going on? It's the most amazing thing that I've ever experienced in my life. I always thought that the farm was the most important mission of my life, but I realize now the fellowship is like, it's like there's an ancient Judean idea that the temple is going to manifest in heaven and then manifest on earth. It's like, what does that mean? It's like, no, no, there's like a physical reality, but it's first is manifesting in the spiritual. I'm like, oh, that's what's happening. It's like virtual, spiritual. It's almost the same. What does that mean, virtual? People from, and all of a sudden, it's like people from Iowa that I've never got to see in in the flesh. Now here we are, like manifesting in the flesh now. (laughs) That's unbelievable. But then I had another idea. Not my idea, Zachariah's idea, because Pastor Nick and I were talking. It's like, we have to do this, figure this thing out. It's like, it's like, well, Jews and Christians, and how, how does that interplay with each other? And it's like, okay, well, there's like certain common values and common interests, and there's, there's a big organization called Christians that are united for Israel, and that's great political organization. And I, they probably, the Christian lobby is what moved the embassy to Jerusalem, not the Jewish lobby. So, okay, we have this political alliance, excellent, two people working together. But that's not the vision that Zechariah has here. So... It says that at one point in time, these believers around the world are going to make a full revolution and to revolve, revolution, to revolve all the way back to Judea. They're going to make like a U-turn and then go all the way back to the beginning and the roots of the Tanakh. And that Judea and Samaria that's under attack now, that is the cradle of biblical civilization. All the events of the Bible happened in Judea and up in Samaria, Bethlehem, Hebron, Jerusalem, just like East Jerusalem. That's where King David reigned. The city of David, that's what they want to cut out of Israel. Can you imagine? It's like all of the biblical parts of Israel, Shiloh, Bethel. It's like all of is the biblical part, that's what they want to call the West Bank, and that's what they want to cut out. It's like outrageous. And there's going to be a people that say, no, no, it's that place that I'm going to. I'm going all the way back to the beginnings and the roots of the Bible, all the way to Judea, into the Hebrew, through a Judean man. This is it. I'm going to go all the way back to learn Torah from Israel. And then look at what Zechariah chapter 2 says. Sing and be glad, O daughter of Zion. This is chapter 2, verse 14 and on. Sing and be glad, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst. Now, it's interesting here. It says, Veshachanti betochech. You know, there's that verse, is, it's a playoff when God says, Build me a tabernacle and I will dwell among you. So here it's saying, Behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst. It's like God's presence is going to come back and be a part of our lives again. That's not about a religion, that's just about living with God in us as a part of our life, dwelling amongst us, being with us, guiding us in our lives. Many of the nations will join themselves to Hashem on that day and they will become a people unto me and I will dwell in your midst. Then you will know that Hashem, master of legions, has sent me to you. Hashem will take Judea as his heritage, his portion upon the Holy Land. And he will choose Jerusalem again. So here again, it goes like, Hashem is going to take Judea as his heritage. So Norway, Denmark, and Germany, and Switzerland, they can try, but they're not going to succeed. Judea is meant to be his heritage, and that is the mission of our generation. But look what happens here. Many of the nations are going to join themselves onto Hashem. It doesn't say that there's going to be then two peoples that are working strategically together. And they will become a people unto me. It's like something that's transcendent happens. A people. It's like one brotherhood of man under the fatherhood of God. That's the vision. That's beautiful. That's amazing. And what has happened right before this generation? A global pandemic that is separated more than I've ever been separated. Everyone has masks in their home, locked down, separated, but the final vision here is a total unity of coming together. And somehow Judea is so significant. God says, no, it's not just in the land. I'm going to that part of the land. That's going to be his heritage. You know, our place overlooks Jerusalem from the mountains. Like We built our windows, so the, the main window that we pray toward, you see like Jerusalem right off there into the distance. So the land of Israel fellowship, it's, 
it's the most important work that I've ever encountered. It's the most important work I've ever done. You know, I love the Bible so much, and I don't know why we love what we love. I just love this book, this transcendent wisdom, so many thousands of years old, that's able to speak to an Instagram, Facebook generation just as profoundly when they didn't have electricity. How could there be such a wisdom so deep and so profound encoded in the most amazing stories that are helping us live the best lives that we could possibly live? Because a life in service of God, a life serving the ultimate good is an ultimately good life. It's as good as can be. And so, I guess I've come here just with a a blessing that Zechariah talks about there being a big earthquake at the end. And so earthquakes have tremors beforehand. We just experienced the first tremor, a global tremor, where the whole world was united in a consciousness around this virus. The whole world was thinking about it, talking about it, trying to fix it, trying to solve it. The world has never been united on an international global scale as it was in this last year. That's just a tremor because soon there's going to be an international global reality that's going to change the whole world, and we're now in that generation. See, every generation has their role. So one generation, maybe it was to walk to the land of Israel, start planting trees, and one generation to fight off the Nazis, Talk about Jacob's troubles. My goodness, a third of our people just erased, annihilated. Then one generation had to have the courage to declare the state, fight off seven nations at the same time. And then another generation had to ingather the exiles. When my grandfather came to Israel, there were 60,000 Jews in the land. In 100 years later, in 2016, there were over 6 million. Never in the world has there been a population explosion From 60,000 to 6 million, that's just never happened before. And from all over the world, that took a generation to bring that in. So many languages. You know, people think that, how did we win that war in 1948? The Jews didn't speak the same language. It's so complicated giving orders in battle. It's like, Moshe, you go to the radio. You back, we need ammo. Back up. You go to the left. You flank to the right. In 1948, it was like, okay, you go to the right, radio back to base. And the guy's next to him says, I'm sorry, I'm from Russia. I don't speak Hebrew. What did he say? The guy from Yemen is like, I speak Arabic. What is he saying? What's he saying? He's like, I'm from Poland. I speak Polish. What is everyone talking about? And we won that war? (laughs) This is the greatest miracle of all times. What is that? And here we are in this last generation now. You know, and I lived on the legends of my grandfather. And then all of a sudden, to see the mountains of Judea at the edge of the desert blossom, it's it's unbelievable. And our generation is to inherit Judea against the squad, against the European Union, against all odds. God will take Judea as his heritage. And then for the Jews in our land to reach out to the nations. Because among the nations are people that are actually called to join us. They're called to the land. They're going to be called to Jerusalem, to a house of prayer for all nations. And it's in this generation that the Jewish people don't need to fight off the nations. We don't need to try to survive. But it's like, you know, we held on to this book. And every force known to humanity came to take this book away from us. The Catholics tried to take it away from us. The Nazis tried to take it away from us. And we held on to this with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, and all of our very, and we held on to it, it wasn't for us. It was that a day would come and the nations would want to learn Torah from the land. And that is the mission of this generation, the last generation that Zechariah saw. And so everyone in their own way, I don't know how many fellowships might arise, more Jews that would rise up and say, all right, let's teach, let's light up the nations. But this is the one that I know that exists now. And so this is an invitation Next time you come to Israel with Pastor Nick to come out to our mountain. And until then, we can stay connected through the Land of Israel Fellowship. That would be the biggest blessing of all. So thank you all so much. Bye, Latov.